Rotten Tomatoes, that movie website, lists 50 of the worst sequels. I'll read to you just a few of them. Jaws 2. Speed 2. Caddyshack 2. Major League 2. You can probably think of a few on your own. But beyond not having originality in title, they also don't have originality in writing, which is part of the problem. But then there's those sequels that actually meet or surpass the success of the first movie. Back to the Future 3, Lethal Weapon 2, Return of the Jedi, Superman 2, Lord of the Rings 2. Usually the success or failure relies on the sequel being well written and so tied to the original that it continues to develop the characters as well as the story, bringing forth new things, new dimensions to the characters, new dimensions to the story, but retaining a consistency of personality and theme. Genesis chapter 17 is a sequel. Genesis chapter 17 is a sequel. As we look at it this morning, I want you to consider that because it's a sequel of Genesis chapter 15, two weeks ago, which was our text as we continue here with the great patriarch Abraham. There's a great deal of important things in Genesis, but if you take anything beyond the creation story from Genesis, I want to encourage you, take note of chapters 15 and 17, because they're all about covenant. They are the foundation of the church, the foundation of who we are as the people of God, what God has done by His grace in His people. And so I just want to look at some of the themes and personalities going from the first to the second iteration of the covenant. Some scholars talk about Genesis 17 as the ratifying of the covenant. Open up to me, with me to chapter 17 in your Bibles, or take a look at, cha uh, at um, page 1 and 2 in your order of service, and you can see the text for today. But quickly, a little review, because it's been eight weeks since we started this series. So you might not, be re you might not have fresh in your mind, at least, what's gone on so far. Eight weeks in our time, 24 years in the time of Abraham, have passed since Genesis chapter 12. Since the Lord, who in Genesis chapter 12 calls himself the Lord, the I Am, and makes promises to make Abram a great nation, a great blessing, blessed to be a blessing to all nations, and the land of Canaan promised for his descendants. When God comes again to Abram in Genesis 15, the word of the Lord comes to him. Do you remember that? The title of God in Genesis 15 is the word of the Lord comes to Abraham, appears to Abraham. Of course, we recall that the word of the Lord is another name for Jesus, right? God's word, God's word, as John tells us. And in Genesis 15, so in that first iteration of the covenant, the word of the Lord comes to Abram and says that he promises to be his shield, that he promises that his son shall be his heir, that he promises that his offspring will be like the stars of the sky, if he can number them. And because of Abram's belief, God counts him righteous. It's been a long time, even since Genesis 15, that first iteration of the covenant, and even longer since Genesis 12. If you go through and calculate Abram's age, in Genesis 12, verse 17, as I've said, 24 years total have passed, and it's been 13 years, at least, since Genesis 13, or 15, rather. In that time, 
a lot has happened too, right? Famines, wars, threats to Abraham's prosperity, both eternal and his own lack of faith. There have been several stumbling passages, just like last week where Father Joshua preached to you on Abram and Sarai taking matters into their own hands, right? And involving Hagar in the story. That they would bring forth a son with Sarai's maid. Last week, Father Joshua explained to us how Abram's lack of faith caused he and Sarai to take that matter into their own hands. And if we look later at today's passage, we see that 13 years have passed since Abram fathered Ishmael. All of this frames today's passage. All of these are themes being brought forward, just like a good sequel brings forward themes from the first movie. All of this is important to recall because if we read today's text in isolation, we might get the wrong idea. We might get the wrong idea that Abram's covenant with God is one of works or one of obedience. And that's not what Genesis 17 is saying at all. But look with me at verse 1 and 2 in today's reading, Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Lord God, or rather, I am God Almighty, sorry, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So if you break down those two verses, what do you see? God commands Abram to walk before me and be blameless, first of all. And second of all, he says, I will make a covenant with you. Do you see how if you take this passage in isolation, it seems to flip Genesis 15 on its head? Right? Or at least it could. You could fall into that misinterpretation that this is all about obedience and that if Abram is obedient to God, then God will covenant with him. Right? Do you see that? That's not what's being said here. St. Paul talks about this and interprets it for the church in Romans chapter 4. And this rests on, his argument rests on this idea of ratifying of a covenant. So this is Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. It's not one of today's texts, but it bears repeating. St. Paul writes to the Roman church, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Well, what is that? That's being declared righteous. Theologians call that justification. He continues in verse 9, Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? What's St. Paul doing there? He's pointing us back to Genesis 15, you see, before Genesis 17. He continues, was it after he was circumcised or before that he was declared righteous, that is? It was not after, but before. What St. Paul here is saying is that God instituted this covenant of faith first with Abram. And so that covenant of faith is actually superior to what's going on in Genesis 17. The Genesis 17 is a particular subset of the covenant of faith. What do I mean by that? That the master story is Genesis 15, and that Genesis 17 is a development of it, an outgrowth of it, you see. Again, this covenant of faith, St. Paul continues to talk about in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. He says, And he received circumcision, that is Abraham, as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, who also follow the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You see, what is St. Paul saying here? Again, to reiterate, 
that the important thing is this covenant of faith. That comes first. That both the circumcised and the uncircumcised, both the Jew and the Gentile, can participate in the covenant of faith, regardless of their circumcision. Right? Because circumcision is the sign of the covenant, particularly with the Jews. Why is that important? Again, because I said that St. Paul is interpreting this Genesis passage and we, as a historical church, do not pit one part of Scripture against the other. That's one of the basic formularies in Anglicanism. That Scripture speaks together. And therefore, if something seems to contradict, you're reading it wrong. And you've got to back up and take a look at what's going on contextually. So this is what's going on contextually. And this is an easy one, because St. Paul just lays it out for us, that the covenant of circumcision is a subset of the covenant of faith. And therefore, the covenant of obedience is a subset of the covenant of faith. Notice, there is consistency between Old and New Testament. It's not like God throws away the Old Testament. Some Christians treat it that way. But no, God takes this theme, a covenant of faith and grace, and brings it forward through the cross to what St. Paul is talking about in his writing to the Romans. That the covenant of faith remains, but the rites, R-I-T-E-S, change. The rites change. Circumcision becomes the sacrament of holy baptism and confirmation. And the faith remains unchanged. As a sign of his promise, God also changes Abraham's name, notice. He adds a letter, one letter that makes all the difference to Abram's name, making it Abraham. Abram becomes Abraham, which means the father of a multitude, It's actually a play in the Hebrew. Look at verse um, 3 of today's reading, Genesis 17. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. What's he talking about here? The covenant of faith. The covenant of faith. That's the eternal covenant that persists from Old to New Testament. Amazingly, this passage in Genesis looks forward not just to Isaac, the immediate fulfillment of the covenant, but also all the way to the New Testament, to the New Covenant. Jump down to verse 19. And God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. In the old covenant, this physical circumcision, this sign done to men, is a sign of this obedience to following God. Right? Again, jump back to 9 through 10. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of my covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Do you see this idea that Abraham's entire household is saved, is made part of that covenant 
as a group. But this New Testament, in the New Testament, that obedience is found in the sacraments of holy baptism. Where just as in the Old Testament, just as a baby who's circumcised on, his, on the eighth day can be part of the covenant family of God, so in the New Testament a baby is baptized to be part of the covenant family of God. The baby has no say in his circumcision and he has no say in his baptism. And yet he's made and imparted into part of God's covenant family. But of course, he must continue. He must continue in that and make Christ his own, as our baptismal rite says. And so in the New Testament, this coupling of obedience is done not just with baptism, but baptism also bestows grace. So it's not just a sign or a token but it's an effectual action of God upon that child or that adult. There's a renewing of grace that's poured into him or her. In the 1662 Catechism, which we hold to be authoritative, the question is asked, what is the inward and spiritual grace of baptism? And the answer is given, a death unto sin and a new birth unto righteousness. For being by nature born in sin and children of wrath, we are hereby made children of grace. This is a paraphrase of what St. Paul says in our second lesson today, Colossians chapter 2. Look with me at the beginning of that. It's on page 3. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, says St. Paul. So walk in him. And then look down at verse 9. For in him the the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That is in Christ. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Do you see how St. Paul ties all that together? That obedience to the ruler of the law. That grace. That relationship to Christ. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, baptism takes this and is both a sign and an an effectual work of grace given by God. St. Ambrose of Milan, the mentor of St. Augustine, says this about it, about circumcision. He says, Therefore, the sign of circumcision remained until the truth arrived. The Lord Jesus arrived, when the Lord Jesus arrived, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because he circumcised the whole person in truth, not a minor bodily member in sign. What's St. Ambrose saying? That far more than this little sign, this little piece of the truth, that's cut away, right, in circumcision, so the whole person is renewed in baptism in Christ Jesus. It's not insignificant that baptism also is called christening. Did you ever hear that term? It's an older term, but we say we might call something a christening gown, the white dress that the baby wears. Or we might um, talk about going to a christening. Sometimes we talk about ships being christened, right? Where someone important takes the bottle of champagne and smashes it on the hull of the ship as it's launched. That's called a christening. What's a christening? It's a naming It's a naming. And so it is that naming is attached both to circumcision and baptism. Notice that's not insignificant. And it's not insignificant to Abraham's story either, or Sarah's, as they are renamed in this passage. Abram becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. Who names them? God himself names them. God changes their name. 
And in the Old Testament culture, the change of a name also meant the change of a destiny. The change of a destiny. Right? Names were not just labels in the Old Testament. They actually said something about the very essence of who the person was. So Abraham, whom we call the great patriarch, his name literally means the patriarch, the father of a multitude, right? Do you see the importance of that for the Christian also? That we are given our names at baptism, if we're baptized as babies, that christening combines the giving of the name with the effectual work of God to bring His grace. It changes our destiny. It changes our trajectory. It makes us, as the Catechism says, not children of wrath, but children of God. Children of God. It makes us not sons and daughters of this world, but sons and daughters of God Almighty. We are a new creation, set with a new trajectory. So what does this say to the church thousands of years after Genesis 17? We can now look back after thousands of years and see the blessings God bestows on Abraham and Sarah through the covenant of grace, the covenant of faith, signed by circumcision. We can see how their trajectory has changed from a couple who's barren, who has no children, to being blessings, not just to their own family, but to nations, and to be new creations. For Abram, Abraham rather, and Sarah are saved by faith, just as you are saved by faith. The covenant remains the same. The right has only changed. And Christ Jesus on the cross changed it. For the Christian, as a son or daughter of Abraham, we are sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah by faith. Once again, look at verses 1 and 2, the beginning of the Genesis 17 passage today. The Lord says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. That promise remains in effect. But, as that subset applies to Abraham, so it applies to us. That we are, as God's own, covenant people, covenant persons, sons and daughters. We are to walk before the Lord. To walk before the Lord. What's God requiring of Abraham? FaceTime. And not the app on your phone. But FaceTime. Literally to be in his face and for him to be in your face constantly. Relationship. Obedience. The Greek, or rather the Hebrew in this passage, the word is ponim, which means face. Face. To walk before me, the Lord says. The word also means go. So literally to walk in the face of God. To walk in the face of God. To have Him looking at you and look at Him at every step of your life. Does that sound familiar? It should. What does Jesus say? Follow me. Walk with me. Be my disciple. He says, follow me no less than 14 times in the Gospel. And then in John 15, he says, abide in me. Scholar C. Westerman writes, to live a life before him, a life in which every step is taken looking to God, and every day of which is accompanied by him, is this idea of being blameless and obedient. It's a high bar. It's not one we can live up to in our own strength. But that's what God desires for us. 
as baptized Christians, as his sons and daughters whom he loves, to walk before him daily, blamelessly in this way that we are constantly looking to him to be morally perfect, to be whole, to be complete. And we might object and say, well, this bar is too high. And yes, that's part of the point. It is. That's part of the point of why we say the Decalogue at the beginning of every month. Lord, I can't meet these requirements, let alone the Beatitudes that Jesus gives us later. Have mercy upon me and incline my heart to keep this law. But what this is in in chapter 17 is a continuation of Genesis 15. That this covenant of grace remains even despite the fact that we don't live blamelessly before the Lord. That we turn our faces away. That we look at other things. That we seek other gods. What vows we take or are taken for us in holy baptism are generally not realized the momentousness of them, that is, until confirmation. We don't realize that what we promise to do to reject the world, the flesh, and the devil and turn to Christ in all things is not something that we can do on our own until we come to an age where we can realize it. But that's where the grace comes in. And that's why confirmation is a sacramental rite of grace. The finality of holy baptism. You see, even though Abraham would walk with God and do his best to be blameless, he would not be blameless. We'll see as we go through the rest of this sermon series. It's not like Abraham continually turns to the Lord and never stumbles again after this. It's not as if somehow he's, made, he's perfect, he's made himself perfect. That's not the point. And certainly his offspring aren't perfect. We saw that in today's psalm, right? And it's not that God ignores Abraham's future sins or the sins of his offspring, as so many people say today. But rather, Abraham was being made perfect because he was declared righteous in the covenant of faith. So, friends, there's a great deal of things that can be mined from this passage, as you've probably ascertained. I've tried to limit myself, but see the fulfillment of Genesis 15 here. See that this is a step, a particular step in the covenant of faith. And finally, there's one last key point which sums it all together, brings it all back to the very first and second verse. Who is it that keeps the covenant? Who is it that bestows the grace It is God Almighty. God Almighty. But as you look at that first verse where the Lord gives His title and calls Himself God Almighty and not the Lord and not um, the God Most High and not the Word of the Lord, you probably don't see in English something that's really important here. This is a specific title for God Perhaps you've heard of it. In Hebrew, it's El Shaddai. El Shaddai. God Almighty, translated simply, but it means so much more. It means the God who makes the barren fertile. As he literally will make Sarah fertile with the son Isaac. It means God who makes what is insufficient, sufficient. The God Almighty of all sufficiency is another way to translate El Shaddai. The word of, the, of God declared Abraham righteous back in Genesis 15 and El Shaddai, the God of all sufficiency, calls him to walk blameless here. Do you see why that's so important? Because what God is saying is I as the God of all sufficiency call you to walk with me. And when you stumble and when you fall, as Abraham just did in the last chapter, my sufficiency, the sufficiency of my grace, of my very self, will be enough for you. Not just forgiveness, notice, but a fullness of grace. 
Pastor Kent Hughes, one of the scholars that I read, says this way. He says, The way we live as Christians is determined by what we think of God. Any thoughts of God less potent than the God of Abram will shrink your soul and neutralize your faith. It's a powerful statement. I think he overstates it a little bit because I don't think that that will neutralize your faith. But I do think this, that how we see God informs our faith. And how we see it informs how we see our relationship with Him in covenant. If you see God as all-sufficient and as the person in whom your sufficiency rests, you're going to see and act in a very different way than someone who's trying to keep obedient only out of duty or only because you think you can do it yourself. Notice our opening collect today went beautifully with this. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your grace and your faithful that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Only by your grace. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises. What are we praying for? That he might give us the grace to walk face to face with Jesus every day of our life. So friends, as we walk from this place with Christ, consider there are people out there, out those doors, who do not see God at all. Some torture themselves with perfectionism. They want to be blameless. They want to win the approval of someone or everyone. They crave the adulation of the world around them. They will end up despondent and despairing and ultimately alone, finding themselves repulsive because they can't even live up to their own standard. Those people need to hear about God's love and covenant. They need to hear about the fullness of this text today, made simpler, of course. But they need to hear of God's loving forgiveness and grace. But there are also people out there, out those doors, out these walls, they constantly seek pleasure for themselves because they don't see God or acknowledge Him. They try to fill themselves up with experiences. That's the new thing, right? Traveling everywhere, going into great debt for it. The latest food, the latest microbrew, the latest comfort for their home, the latest thing that they think will fill them up they too will end up despondent and despairing and alone and find themselves repulsive because they will be enslaved to those things. They too need to hear about God's loving covenant with an emphasis perhaps on obedience as well as grace, but certainly forgiveness. But what's harder is those like you and me who call themselves Christians but don't see God as El Shaddai. Those who don't even perceive Him as all-sufficient. Some struggle, as Christians even, to earn His favor, not realizing that it's been given to them. They try to earn a gift continually. These are folks who get stuck in works righteousness. God can never be pleased. And therefore, they can never rest in Him. But then there's also those who presume on his grace, what people call cheap faith or cheap grace, right? Who partake of him, who assure themselves in the covenant of faith, but who have no intention on obeying him, who have no intention on walking before him. We all perhaps know people or have been that person at one point or other in our life. We need to hear about the covenant of faith and how God calls us to obedience. But more importantly, we need to perceive that He is the all-sufficient God whom we can trust in and with all things. Most of us fall one way or the other when it comes down to it. I've noticed in my pastoral counseling, most people are too hard on themselves and don't see the grace of God 
or they're too easy on themselves and don't see his call to walk before him. Again, we rest in God's, self, in God's all-sufficiency. It's enough for you. It's enough for me. So like Abraham, let us stop and see God as El Shaddai, as the almighty, all-sufficient one whose grace is enough for us. And remember, friends, that in Christ there is a sequel to this life. And that sequel is vastly superior to the original. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.